My name is Anara Gard. Um, I've worked in suicide prevention for a long time, as you'll see um, on my bio, including, oops. I've worked on the Know the Signs campaign, which I hope you're all familiar with, um, as well as working with uh, Orange County, with Bhuvana here. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed the keynote speech by Ellie Stout, I'm proud to say that I hired her uh, at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center uh, when I was the deputy director there. And I'm thrilled with uh, how she has grown into the position and now is the director. Um, I would love to hear from a few of you why you chose this workshop. You have other choices. So why did you pick coming to learn about how we can restrict and reduce access to lethal means? Anybody? I could call on you, but volunteering <laughs> is better, don't you think? Yes. We work for uh, uh, suicide prevention. We do trainings, and uh, past year we've seen an increase in uh, firearms usage and in the Santa Clarita area. <coughs> we just had another um, attempt with a firearm, and you know, it seems like means matter, yeah. and um, the accessibility to means is, uh, you know, significantly impacts the risk of the person completing the suicide, so I need to know more. Okay. So for those of you who couldn't hear in the back, she's seen an increase, particularly in firearm suicide and attempts, and thinks that it's important to pay attention to um, how means matter. Anybody else want to share why you picked this workshop this morning? You looked at me like you had something to say. No. I'm like, don't pick me. No. Okay. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I am here. I'm currently working on my internship at a high school in Pacoima, and I feel that I'm just trying to gather information, how to better support the students I work with, and how to know the signs, how to, you know, better provide service to them. And I know that a lot of the students I work with um, use drugs, so I know that that might be another, and they express suicidal ideation. So okay. I'd just like to know more about it. Great. Anybody else? One more? Because you have to pick one. <laughs> oh. But I'm a community health worker and I work on the line and at any moment and I have gotten those calls. So any anything I can do to be prepared for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Boob and I saw you had your hand up as well. Um sure. Uh, I'm in an administration for mental health services in Orange County and we are uh, finally moving forward to having a suicide prevention task force coalition and you're very uh, actively involved in helping us get there so thank you for that and uh, I have been to a, another session where you had done media messaging for us which was fantastic and so I knew I had to come and listen to you and see what you had to say so we can move forward to bringing that message to Orange County. Thank you. I'll pay you later for those kind words. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, okay. So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, I want to talk about what do we mean by means restriction? What do we mean by lethal means? What about means substitution? And then we'll focus in on the leading methods and some programs and research and strategies that have shown success with those particular methods. Um, we want to talk, as the keynote did, about it being part of a comprehensive suicide prevention strategy. I have an exercise for you all to do. And um, I was also asked to pay some attention particularly to three populations, older adults, rural populations, even though we're in the heart of LA right now, um, and youth. Uh, although it says questions here at the end, I actually welcome questions throughout, so don't try to hang on to that question for 75 minutes, okay? Um, we, because we started late, we will end late, but not as late as we started because I don't want to cut into your lunch hour. So we may go five minutes over, but we're not going to go more than that. I'm not going to be in between you and lunch. All right, questions, that's okay? All right, did everybody get a handout, by the way? Okay, if, if you didn't find one on your chair, there's ones on other chairs, so just grab it from another chair. So um, 
I started working in injury prevention um, a long time ago now. And injury prevention is an older, more established, and you'll get all these slides afterwards, so for ease of writing things down, just so you know. Um, Injury prevention is an older and more established field. Suicide prevention is actually a newer, younger field. And I think there are some real lessons from injury prevention that we can learn on the suicide side of things. And one is the way in which injury prevention has organized itself around what's called the three E's. So the first one is education. That's pretty obvious. The second one is environment, or sometimes it's put as engineering. And the third one, is enforcement or policy. So uh, education might be a billboard campaign to remind you to buckle up and wear your seatbelt. Environment or engineering would be having a vehicle that has the buzzer that tells you you didn't buckle up yet, right? It's already built into your vehicle. Um, and enforcement would be having a law, a primary seatbelt law, and actual enforcement of that law so that it has real teeth behind it. Um, and the most effective strategies use two or three of these. One by itself is not enough. Just having that campaign is not enough to make people change their behavior. And just having the law, if people don't know about it, isn't enough either, right? Just having the car beep at you may not be enough if you don't realize there could be a consequence of not buckling up either an injury consequence or a ticket consequence. Uh, and in suicide prevention, we've tended to focus on education a lot. How many of you have been through a gatekeeper training? Anybody? Like QPR or ASSIST? Okay, well they're wonderful things to do where they anywhere from an hour to two days you can really learn how to ask the questions, how to have a conversation with someone, how to refer them to help, how to get more comfortable yourself with those skills. Um, but education really hasn't been enough and we haven't focused a lot on these other two and that's what this workshop is going to focus more on. A lot of times you'll see a graphic or even uh, a list of risk factors for suicide. I hope you all have seen something like this in the past. Um, and one of the problems with portraying it like this is that they all look like they're equal. And yet we know that a history of a previous suicide attempt is much more predictive of a future attempt than say just having physical illness. Even though Ellie talked about pain and yes that's an obvious thing, but many, many people have physical disabilities and illnesses and don't become suicidal. And I want us to focus on this part of it, the access to harmful means. So how do we restrict or reduce access to lethal means? The first one is the one that we did for years. We thought we should need to make the person safe. We will put them in an environment and remove all um, ways in which they could harm themselves. Uh, a very restrictive environment. And we don't do that as much anymore, and for good reason. We also can put a barrier of some kind in between the person and the means. We can put more time in between the person and the means, because we know that often it is a short-lived crisis, and if we can get them through the crisis, there's time for them to get help, there's time for the crisis to pass, there's time for intervention to happen. And finally, we can make the means, and thereby any attempt, less lethal. So here are some images of barriers that we place. So can any of you, I know it's a little washed out, can any of you identify what are the harms that we're looking at here? I've got a handy little laser pointer. So anybody recognize this? Yes? Cabinet lock. And what might be in that cabinet that you don't want kids to get access to? Sorry? Liquor? Firearms? That's, yeah. Medications. Medications, cleaning supplies. Mm -hmm. What about here? What is that behind the fence? Swimming pool, right? 
And here in California, we have a four-sided fencing law. Um, what about these? Safety goggles. And that protects what? Your eyes. Your eyes. So it could be from a chemical splash or from um, wood splinters if you're doing something with wood. Down here, we've got a highway overpass barrier. Uh, I put this one in of a friend I know who took this picture, had this picture taken when she was back in India and on a scooter. And he's wearing the helmet, but she's <laughs> smiling away, no helmet on her. Uh, we all gave her a little bit of a hard time about that. Uh, and then this is from the Empire State Building, actually. So we're placing barriers between the person and harm. So when there's something that's really dangerous, like high voltage electricity, we don't just put up a sign, right? That's not enough. Education is not enough. We put up a big fence around it. So here, there's the tower back there. So there's the fence and the warning sign, both. So there's some education that's going on here. But education isn't for everyone. There's no education here. The barrier is designed to keep that bear from getting to those chickens. So there's some situations in which education not only is not enough, but it might not be appropriate. And we really want to put our trust in the barrier, not in the signs. But also, I really want to point out here, um, I think uh, on one of the slides that was shown earlier today, uh, there, I think maybe it was in that last, one of the last ones that Ellie had, from the Centers for Disease Control, their language was something about removing access to lethal means um, for people who are in a suicidal crisis. If we wait until they're in the crisis, it's a little late to start removing all the access to the means. And for many of these, we're protecting everybody, right? We want to, we don't want any children to fall into that swimming pool. But the Empire State Building we're preventing somebody from jumping. We're also preventing them from falling. We're preventing them from accidentally flinging their cell phone over the edge and killing somebody 87 floors below. So when we do creating barriers, we are protecting everyone. And I want to really emphasize, this is everyday, ordinary stuff. We do this all the time. It just seems <coughs> new when we start doing it in suicide prevention. Um, so before I get into what are lethal means, well, no, that's fine. We'll keep it there. So what are some lethal means? When we say we're worried about methods, what kind of methods are we worried about? You mentioned firearms. Yeah. What else? Pills. Medication, pills. Anything else? Knives. Knives. Bridges. Bridges. Absolutely. Uh, but not all means are equally lethal. Um, and you'll see that when I show you some data. So we, we've mentioned all of these except for uh, suffocation and strangulation. Suffocation is usually with carbon monoxide, plastic bags, or it's also known as asphyxiation. Strangulation is more like hanging. But in the data, a lot of times those two causes are merged as one. Um, and sometimes people will combine methods as well. They'll take medication and then also use another method. Um, but not only are all methods aren't equally lethal, people don't always choose the same methods. Um, and culture plays a big role in there. Does anybody know how the writer Virginia Woolf died? She uh, put rocks in her pockets and walked into the ocean and drowned. That's not a method that we see very often in this country. There were also methods that were used a lot 100 years ago that we don't use now. And sometimes that's because the method changed, and sometimes it's because culture has changed. In Sweden, there were three bridges that accounted for all bridge suicides in the whole country. There's lots of bridges, but only three were where people were choosing to jump. 
So we have to look carefully at what is the method and why are people choosing that and how can we focus in on those particular, and they choose them for many reasons, availability, how easy it is, how accessible it is, how popular it is, and the role of celebrities really makes a difference here. A study came out last spring that looked at the effect of Robin Williams' death. The positive increases to crisis lines and those calls went way, way, way up. It was fantastic. People were reaching out for help. The negative, in the four years since, we saw an increase in suicides, especially men, 35 to 50-ish, and especially by hanging. That's how Robin Williams died. The same thing happened after Marilyn Monroe took her life and there was intense media coverage. We saw a huge increase in white women in her age group taking pills and dying in the way that she did. So we're really, uh, we're influenced. We copy the behavior of people who we look up to, positive and negative. And so when we talk about lethal means restriction, we really want to integrate that in with our messaging um, and with our media campaigns and our outreach to the media. And reducing access can really make a life-saving difference, and I'll be really drilling down into that. As I said before, many of the attempts are occurring during a short-term crisis. And I want to point out that, of course, just removing the means isn't solving the person's problems. They still may feel acutely suicidal. They still may struggle with depression or with all of the life problems that led them to this instance. So it's not like, okay, great, we removed the means, no more problem. But when the means are less available or less deadly, rates of suicide decline for the reasons that I mentioned before. We're buying time for either the crisis to pass or for us to offer help to them. How many people may have heard a number about how much time elapses between somebody feeling suicidal and attempting? Have any of you heard that? Oh, thank goodness, I don't have to dispel that myth. All right. Um, there, there's sort of a myth out there that it's five minutes or less, um, which was shown in a study, and it was a study in one emergency room in one hospital in Texas, and only of people under 35. So, and, and I think we feel really hopeless if we hear that. Only five minutes, what the hell could I do in five minutes? A different study um, that was also small, but interviewed 82 people who had attempted suicide and found that it still was a short time for many of them between when they thought about it and when they made the attempt, but 75% of them had contact with somebody else during that time. So there was an opportunity for them to reach out, to tell somebody, and maybe they did, we don't know. There was an opportunity for somebody else to notice something. And I think that's really important for us to realize that just because there may be a short time doesn't mean that it's hopeless. People earlier were telling some pretty powerful stories this morning that were personal. And I'll share with you something personal as well. Um, one of my children, when he was 12 years old, as I was driving him to school, um, he had been increasingly reluctant to go to school. It was harder and harder to get him out the door. And as we, we were late, of course, and as we pulled into the driveway for me to drop him off, he said, I want to kill myself. Uh, this was before I worked in the field of suicide prevention and I sort of hit the brakes uh, and didn't really know what to do. Um, I sent him to school anyway, but then I went and called our health care provider and they said, go get him. So I did. And that was the start of a long journey. Um, and he saw physicians, social workers, several psychiatrists, school counselor, not one of them asked us if we owned a gun. Now they may have just assumed, 
oh, it's a nice liberal family living in the such and such suburb outside of Boston in Massachusetts, which has strong gun laws. But they assumed, oh, she doesn't look like she would have a gun. We were even told by the school that he couldn't come to school until a psychiatrist signed off that he was out of danger. But no psychiatrist said, what kind of danger is he in at home? And it was left up to us to run around the house and try to figure out, well, hmm, where are we going to keep this pocket knife? What kind of pills are there? What might he do? How, do we have to watch him 24 hours a day and stay up all night? So um, <coughs> part of what fuels my interest in this is happily the field has changed some, but I would, I would be much happier if at least one of those professionals had mentioned, are there any means by which he could harm himself? And let's make a plan together so that you can deal with that. A little bit more wisdom from the field of injury prevention. This is only, I'm only doing two lessons from the field. We also organize primary prevention, secondary, and tertiary. And I like to think of it that way, like concentric circles of protection around the person. So primary prevention is where you want to prevent the event from occurring in the first place. You have those anti-lock brakes on your car, <coughs> great, you don't get in a crash. Secondary is, the event occurs, but you don't want an injury to come out of it. So the brakes don't work, you crash the car, but the airbag goes off, your seatbelt works, you're not hurt, you've got a crumple zone in the front of the car, you're in good shape. But again, the crash occurred, you didn't get injured. In tertiary is, the crash occurs, you do get injured, but you have rapid response, EMS shows up, somebody calls 911, or you have that or is it OnStar, whatever, and you get good trauma care. So your broken leg doesn't get any worse, you don't get sepsis, you don't die. So how could we translate this to suicide prevention? Well, primary prevention, we don't want the person to attempt in the first place, right? Secondary is maybe they make an attempt, but it's not a lethal attempt. And then tertiary is after the attempt, they get really good care, both physical, medical care if they need it, mental health care, and all the other forms of support, emotional support, psychological support, whatever else is needed. So does that make sense? Okay. And we're mostly going to be focusing on primary and secondary here. So primary, we want to prevent the attempt in the first place. One way to do that is encouraging help seeking. So this photo on the left is taken here in Los Angeles at a subway, I think, or a railway station. And as you can see over here, not very well, but there is a sign that encourages people to call the local suicide crisis line. And over on the right is a similar sign at a railway line in Northern California that has both a sign showing don't walk here because it's an active railroad. And then it says there is help and a phone number. The word suicide doesn't appear on that sign because they didn't want it to be, they didn't want to associate as the railway line with the idea of suicide. They didn't want to encourage people to think about, well, here's a place where I could do this but they did want to encourage help seeking. Signs can be really handy when there's places where you can't otherwise restrict access. You can't fence off every mile of rail line, but we can at least encourage people reaching out for help and maybe stop the event from occurring in the first place. We don't have good research to know how effective this is. When people call the line, they're not being asked a lot, well, where did you find our phone number, right? They're spending more time on providing help to the person than, gee, you know, how many times did you see it? And, oh, where was that sign? We're not probing for that kind of information. And then, so reducing access to lethal means, encouraging help seeking, those are both examples of primary prevention. Any other ways that you can think of? Okay, so secondary, 
where you want to reduce the impact of the event. Having smaller amounts of dosage available, and I'll drill down into that. So you have a life vest on, you still fell out of the boat, but you didn't drown. Or you're wearing your bike helmet or the helmet on the scooter, you still fall off, but you don't have a brain injury as a result, right? Or bridge nets. Um, we're still waiting to see whether there's research to show if the net is there, I imagine that fewer people will even bother to jump because if they want to end their life and they see that the net is there and they're not going to end their life, it's just going to turn into a hassle. Somebody's going to come pick them up. They're going to get stuck in the net, whatever, right? So I think we have good reason to believe the nets alone will prevent the jump. And if they do jump, they're not going to die, but we're maybe preventing the event. So it could be primary prevention as well as secondary. Any other ideas of how we could lessen the impact of a suicide attempt? In some institutions, they have um, what are called uh, breakaway bars uh, in the shower, for example. So if someone tried to hang themselves in the shower, the weight of their body would make it collapse and they would not be able to uh, carry through with the hanging. So that's another example. So we get asked a lot, but aren't they going to choose another way? Aren't they just going to go find another way to die? I don't know if that's a, something that you all have heard or have even thought. Um, and, and this argument does come up a lot. It, in the years of trying to get a barrier built on Golden Gate Bridge, that was given as a reason why not to spend the money and ruin the view and all the other arguments of why people didn't want a barrier or a net put on the bridge. The answer was often, yeah, but if they're going to kill themselves, they're just going to kill themselves. There's nothing you can do. It's really a hopeless statement. Um, and that photo is actually uh, a design that was once proposed for Golden Gate. And actually the evidence shows us that no, there isn't. So bear with me as I give you some specific examples because I think it's, uh, if I can illustrate it in a way that you can picture it, you will remember it better than me just saying, oh no, they won't. You know, you don't have to believe me. But so let me give an example. In Bern, Switzerland, um, there was a uh, bridge that was a well-known place where people jumped. It's very mountainous there, very high bridges. They put a safety net in. Not only did the suicide stop at that site, but even though there were other bridges nearby, people didn't go jump from those bridges. They could. It's right available to them, but they didn't. There was no change at other sites. In Augusta, Maine, there was a bridge right near the psych hospital, and it had a barrier. But then they were working on the bridge in a construction project, and they took the barrier down. And it took them two years to fix the bridge and put the barrier back up. In those two years, the suicides went up. When it was reinstalled, the suicides went back down. Now this was not done as part of a suicide prevention project. Most of these are just natural experiments where you look at the data before and you look at the data after and there's your answer, right? You can do the math. Um, in New Zealand, there also was a study there that found that a bridge barrier was effective and it didn't increase. In Bristol, England, uh, they put up barriers and it cut the deaths by half and again, no evidence of jumping from other places. This has been shown in Washington, D.C. It's been shown in Ithaca, New York, near Cornell University, where there are bridges over gorges. So it's very interesting that people could easily go to another spot, but they don't. For whatever reason, they prefer the one. If they get there and they see that they're not able to, maybe enough time passes. Maybe it gives them the chance to rethink. So often people are ambivalent about ending their lives. And for sure, there are some people who will be very, very determined and they will have strong intent. And if they're thwarted in one way, they'll find another way. Or if one attempt 
uh, doesn't kill them, they will make another attempt and maybe repeated other attempts until they do die. But that's a small minority. Because 90% of people who have attempted and survived, they die from other causes later in life. They do not go on to die by suicide. There are people who die on their first attempt. They're not included in that 90%, but I think that's important. And I want to give two more examples. Um, in the United Kingdom, years ago, all through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they used coal gas to heat their homes and as their cooking gas. And coal gas creates a lot of carbon monoxide. It's very lethal. You may have seen old movies where people put their head in the oven. That's why, because it was a coal gas oven. They reformulated the coal gas, not for suicide purposes, uh, for environmental purposes. And that removed a lot of the noxious element out of it. Suicides in the UK dropped by nearly a third, and, but suicides from other causes only increased a little tiny bit. So they made a huge impact nationally by changing that formula of the coal gas. And then in Sri Lanka, I'm fascinated by what they did in Sri Lanka. On the one hand, it's a culture that's so different than ours, but on the other hand, they really put some elements in. So in Sri Lanka, they had the second highest rate of suicide in the world. And it was primarily, any guesses what means it might have been? Pesticides, people ingesting pesticides. And they embarked on a multifaceted campaign. I'll talk a little bit more later, but for the starters, they started regulating and banning some of the most toxic forms. And suicide rates dropped in half by making that leading method less available. I don't know what it did in terms of the mosquitoes or the pests. I didn't <laughs> look into that. But I would, I would take some more mosquitoes over um, having the second highest suicide rate in the world. OK. Any questions or comments on this? You're welcome to argue with me. You said you were going to talk about smaller dosage later. So I'm still mm -hmm. Coming up. So let's look at LA County, because that's where we are today. I live in Sacramento, but I'm here in LA County and happy to be here. How many of you are, I, I know one Orange County, I know a San Diego, are the rest of you all from LA County? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is 10 years of data. It's important to look at a lot of data at once, not just a single year, because that could be some kind of anomaly. And I had to pick only through 2014 because I didn't have the more recent two years for one of these. But the picture didn't change. The proportions are the same. So this is deaths on the left and hospitalizations on the right. What do you think orange is? What cause? The biggest slice of the pie of suicide deaths in LA County over 10 years, which means, Hanging. sorry? Hanging. Hanging is what you think. OK, any other guesses? Firearms. Firearms? Anything? And overdoses, okay, those are the three main. Um, and then what might be the blue here? Pills. Okay. You ready for the results? Orange is firearms. And look where orange is over here. It's this little teeny tiny slice. Because firearms are very deadly. And if you attempt suicide with a firearm, the chances are very great that you will die from that attempt. Hanging is the gray, which is this one. And again, very small over here. Poisoning is the light blue. So a lot, three quarters of the hospitalizations are due to poisoning. And of course, poisoning is primarily pills in our country, not pesticides, um, and a pr still a pretty big chunk of the deaths. And cutting, somebody said knives, pretty big over here for hospitalization, very small for dying. Um, and I don't have it up there, but um, this sort of mustard, whoa, this sort of mustard yellow, that's jumping from heights. 
bridges, buildings, what, whatever. And again, pretty small. So I think this slide like really shows you it's a very different picture if we're talking about mortality versus morbidity. Yes. And I apologize if I missed it. So the, the diagram on the right are the, uh, uh, the, the non-fatalities. Correct. For attempts, and the one on the left are the fatalities. Correct. OK, so the firearm uh, is really tiny on yes. the attempts. Yes. And that could be, for example, someone may have uh, fired a shot into their abdomen or their torso, right? Okay, now, yeah, okay. Does that make sense? That does make sense. But if we want to make a difference in deaths in LA County, and you can't do everything, maybe your efforts need to go to the biggest chunk. Because imagine if the orange wasn't there. So we're going to talk about that. Let's talk about firearms. And originally I was going to do it last because it's Still a little bit of a loaded topic, but then I thought, hey, it's the leading method. We got to tackle it first. So I'm going to focus on environment changes and enforcement changes. So um, promoting safe household storage is one tried and true technique. It's especially good for unintentional, like kids getting access to guns. It's a little less good for suicide prevention because the person who knows where the key is or knows the combination may be the person who wants to end their life, right? Um, but, for example, in rural Alaska, they did a study where they were distributing gun cabinets for free to homes that wanted them, and they did find that it really helped people lock their guns up. They went from 89% of them not storing their guns locked, and only a third of them then did it after they got the free gun cabinet. And that's rural Alaska, where you think, well, they want their gun handy to shoot the moose? I don't know. <laughs> what? Wolves? Whatever they have. Another aspect is you can store it off-site, particularly during a crisis time. Um, with a, there's a, it depends on where you are, but there's different programs where you might be able to store it at a firing range, at a shooting range, uh, with law enforcement. It, there's a lot of variability there. Um, but there's been some studies that have found that both law enforcement and gun retailers themselves could be amenable to that idea. Again, they don't want suicides. Voluntary removal from the home. There's been some studies that have found that, yes, families of gun owners and gun owners have said, yeah, you know, if somebody in my home were feeling suicidal, and I had an easy way to do this, I'd be willing to remove the firearms from the home until the crisis passed. Um, I've never forgotten hearing about a family in Maine many years ago where their older son uh, took the family firearm and died by suicide. And the family asked for the firearm back and it was returned to them. And the younger son then used it two years later to take his life. Um, and I just, I can't get over that, you know, the idea that, uh, that they kept the firearm and it was still accessible to the younger son. And then there's court-ordered removal, which sounds a little ominous, but maybe not. I also want to mention um, two other thoughts here. In Switzerland, a natural experiment resulted because they, uh, they have a Swiss army, even though they never go to war, and young people have to join the army or do some kind of service, and they carry rifles around when they're in the army. And they changed it so that you could no longer take it home with you on the weekends, and suicides decreased. So even just limiting it part of the week made a difference of them not being allowed to take the firearms home with them. Um. But we have to ask whether the locks and the boxes are enough for the reason I mentioned before. Who's got access to it? Maybe the very person who needs it. Uh, MIT just was awarded a grant from, I think from the Veterans Administration, and they've created a prototype of a box to store a gun. This one has some kind of uh, fingerprint combination on the top. But the prototype that MIT has designed, which is large enough that you could put a rifle or a shotgun in it, it takes two people to unlock it. You need four thumbs, which I think is a fascinating approach. 
because if, then if you're going to unlock the gun, the other person gets to ask, why are you taking the gun out? Um, so it'll be really interesting. It's not on the market yet, but I was thrilled to see that this is, um, if you Google it enough, you can um, probably find it. And then on the right, that's uh, a trigger lock, in case you all aren't familiar. Um, okay. And of course, we want people to store the ammunition separately, and we want them to store their gun unloaded, uh, if at all possible. So that's some on environment. Let's look at education. We want to educate people about what I just said, about safe storage. We can educate them about lock giveaway programs that are available. Um, lethal means counseling by providers. That's on the handout that you have. It's called CALM. It's a free online training on the SPRC website. It's also available as an in-person training. And it's called Counseling on Access to Lethal Means. And it's designed for both healthcare providers and mental health providers to really walk them through and teach them how do you raise this topic with your patients or with your patient's family? How do you get comfortable with it? What do you do with the information when they tell you? So all those things that I wished that our providers had raised with me, this course teaches providers on how to do that. And the little citations there are just showing you, yeah, it's got some evidence and some research behind it. I have a six-page bibliography. If anybody wants the full citations, be happy to provide them. We heard a lot about the New Hampshire gun shop project earlier from um, Ellie, so I won't go into that um, into too much detail. But I do want to spend a little time on the culture because many of us who work in urban settings and who work in um, do-gooder fields, as I think probably most people here are do-gooders of some kind, many of us also tend not to be firearm owners. Um, and maybe aren't that knowledgeable even about firearms. And we may not always know how to talk to people who are firearm owners and who are very dedicated to keeping their firearms. Um, so one study found that the very owners who store their guns unlocked and loaded weren't really open to having this conversation about firearm safety. Um, that doesn't mean that they might not be open to a conversation about suicide risk, but that firearm safety didn't really resonate with them. A newer study found that using the term means safety was much more acceptable than saying means restriction. Nobody wants to be restricted, right? But we do care about safety. Um, the, the third one is focusing on the firearm dealers in New Hampshire as a survey that was done as part of that project. Um, and then the last one, I want to spend a little minute on it, where um, folks in, did a study in rural Oregon primarily, asking firearm owners. They tested four different messages with them. Regular old suicide prevention messages, like, you know, if you're feeling suicidal, call this number. And then they kept crafting them more and more. And the one that really resonated with the firearm owners had a message about protecting yourself and your family as part of being a, I have to look at my note to make sure I get it right, because it was their language, part of being a proud, responsible, and safe gun owner. So they were really paying respect to the gun owners, not sort of saying, well, you shouldn't do that. Um, and that also had language about uh, wanting to do this for people who might not be in the right state of mind to handle weapons. And I thought that was interesting language. It didn't say a mental health problem. It didn't say a mental illness. It's saying not in the right state of mind to handle weapons, which could include not just suicide, right? It could include somebody who's in a rage or on a binge of drinking or maybe something else. So Shasta County, some years ago, took what New Hampshire had done. They tested it out locally. And Shasta County and New Hampshire are actually not that different. They're both heavily white. They're about the same size in terms of population. And they're quite rural and a lot of gun owners in both locations. But Shasta, even knowing that, Shasta didn't want to just take New Hampshire and put it to use. 
they really tested it locally and made sure that it was going to be accepted um, and then created. You can see they have a little Shasta County logo down here and on their brochure they also listed on the back of it all of the firearms dealers where you could store your gun temporarily with them if you wanted to. Um, other places in California are now adopting this. Tuolumne County did it. Um, San Diego is in the process. What was the other one? Oh, Solano. Um, those are the ones that I, that I know of off the top of my head. So I think um, uh, we can't just assume that all gun owners are the same, right? We really need to localize. Um, every year, as part of the Each Mind Matters campaign, we put out a Suicide Prevention Week toolkit and it has a different focus every year. And last year's toolkit included these gun shop activities. And this screenshot just shows you some of the pieces. You can get the brochure, customizable, the print ready files, activity tip sheets. Did anybody use this toolkit last year? One, yes. Um, so this is on the Each Mind Matters Resource Center. Uh, you can also find the brand new 2018 Toolkit, because Suicide Prevention Week is coming up when? Next week. Next week. But the old ones are housed there, which is also good to know. So there's a lot of this information. You can download it straight from the Resource Center and put it to use. So I said court ordered. Does anybody know about the gun violence restraining order that we have here in California? Is this news to y'all? I need, I need nods or shakes, otherwise I think you fall asleep with your eyes open. Okay, so a couple of years ago, we passed a gun violence restraining order law here in California. It's based on domestic violence restraining orders. And it allows family members, household members, or law enforcement to petition a court and have someone who is threatening violence to themselves and or to others a judge can then create an order to temporarily remove their guns and prevent them from purchasing new guns for a period of time. So this is enforcement. And this website, speakforsafety.org, has tons of information there, and I really encourage you to check it out. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this. At the time that they passed this, only two other states had done it, Connecticut and Indiana. Connecticut found that their law reduced firearm suicides by almost 14%, and their law was not as strong as ours. On average, law enforcement was removing seven guns for each order. So this was not a case of they have one gun. And, and I'll show you a little bit why. A third of the people who had their guns removed were offered access to drug and alcohol counseling or mental health counseling, and often it was the first time that they'd been offered that. And we think at least one suicide was prevented for every 10 to 20 orders. Our law is too new yet to have that kind of result. Um, Indiana also saw a 7.5% reduction in firearm suicides. And this is why there were seven guns on average, because this was a survey done of gun owners by the Pew Research Center. A third said that they have one gun. Two thirds say they had more than one gun. Of those two third guns, 37% said they have two to four, and 29% say they own five or more. Okay, so you can, you can draw your own conclusions, but I think there's reason to believe that when people um, are threatening harm to others and they own a lot of guns, we want to be concerned. The gun violence restraining order law was really supported by law enforcement and it grew out of one particular mass shooting um, in Santa Barbara some years ago in which the parents knew that their son had all kinds of problems and lots of firearms and law enforcement had no legal way to remove the firearms from the individual. And after the tragedy, they were very, very distressed that they had not been able to prevent it. Now they have a tool available to them. This is not a 5150. It has nothing to do with whether or not a person has a mental health condition. It is based on their behavior, 
on what they say, what they do, threats that they make, firing shots, threatening neighbors, threatening family members. Okay, so I want to be really clear about that. Not all mental health people were um, supporting this law because they thought it was going to deny someone with a mental health condition their right to own a firearm. You can have all the diagnoses in the world, but that doesn't give you the right to behave in ways that are threatening and will make people unsafe. All right, so is that clear? The order doesn't require them to seek counseling, but it can often be recommended by the judge, and they might feel a little more uh, pressure to do it because they want to have their firearms returned to them. This is a civil procedure. It's not a criminal one. But they get served with um, an order, just like they would being served by a restraining order by a representative of the court. <coughs> and the order can last from 21 days up to a year, and at the end of that time, if the person is still threatening, the judge can renew the order. So it, temporary can mean a short time, and it can mean a fairly long time. I'm not a lawyer, so the technicalities of all this, you know, if you ask me, you're welcome to ask me anything, but I may not know the answer to the technical questions, but the website, speakforsafety.org, has a lot more. So in the first two years of the law, the orange and the red is where most of the orders were, have been served, and it's mostly, hello, LA County, and San Diego County, and Santa Barbara County. And in all three of those counties, law enforcement is well aware of it and is very supportive, and law enforcement themselves can petition. If they get word that there is somebody that they think is going to engage in a mass shooting or is threatening all kinds of uh, harm to others, they can petition the judge for this. There's also a video that's on, the link is on the handout that the San Diego City Attorney created um, advocating for this, of how it can help keep communities safe. Short little five minute video. And I don't have, I don't have 2018 data, I'm sorry. So just a little taste of family member or household member, you don't have to be a blood relative, but you live in the household with them. If you think that there's strong likelihood that they're going to harm themselves, and it doesn't have to be with the firearm, or harm someone else, and they own a gun. So it's those two conditions. Strong likelihood of harm, owning a firearm, you petition your superior court and ask for a gun violence restraining order. And there's all kinds of tools on that website. You also can just contact your local law enforcement to tell them about it, and they may petition. And so here's an, a little example where it might be appropriate. My son's been struggling at college and has alienated himself from his friends. Lately, he's been posting violent content online and going to a shooting range. He owns a number of guns, and I'm worried he's going through a crisis and needs help. They can't necessarily force him to get the help with this behavior, but they can at least petition to have the firearms removed and hopefully get him some help or let this crisis pass. All right? Yes? I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm just wondering how long after you know, a petition has been filed that you can get that hearing. Um, I, it's on the website, and it's something like 24 hours or 48 hours. It's, it's quite short. Yeah, and then I believe it's 24 hours after the order, after the hearing, the ruling, that they need to surrender their firearms. So the idea is to move it along. Good question, though. Even if you're not one of those three categories, family member, household, or law enforcement, there are other ways in which you can get involved. And I should say here that there is a bill that passed the Senate. It's on the governor's desk. As of this morning, he hadn't signed it yet. Um, that would expand it to school personnel could also apply for a restraining order because of the school shootings that we've seen happen around the country. Um, but other people can be involved. If you are a mental health provider or a health care provider, for example, you can tell your clients, your patients, and their family members about this tool and this option for them. Um, and we already have a law, if you're a psychotherapist, you you can warn family members and law enforcement if you're really concerned about a client being dangerous. 
Um, lawyers can get involved. The Speak for Safety website has a whole, if you click on resources, you can see if you're a this, here's what you can do if you're a that. There's a special role for elder care. There's a special role for um, a few other categories. Mental health providers were proposed in the law early on and it got taken out. I would love to see it get put back in at some point. Um, but anyway, so the law may expand um, if Governor Brown signs, signs the bill. A couple of resources that um, are not on your handout, but they'll be in the slides. There is a new guide for firearms retailers and range owners about how to respond after a suicide. Oh, you have one with you? Well, I have the one with the partnership with the NSSF for AFSP. Yes. And so that, that's it. So it's sponsored by the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, there was also a big study that came, uh, not study, a big report, the emerging role of healthcare provider training programs in firearm suicide prevention. So if you are a healthcare provider, that would be of interest to you. Um, and then a new article about applying a social ecological model to firearm suicide prevention, which is really looking at um, sort of all of the concentric circles around a person, the community, the society, the family, the individual. All right, we're gonna, yes. So this is a little different than what you're mentioning there. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention partnered with the trade organization for gun retailers and gun range owners, it's the National <coughs> Sports Shooting Foundation. And there's a brochure that we developed that they can give to, um, people who purchase a gun at point of sale, there's posters, and we also have a gatekeeper training that we can do. And so the National Sports Shooting Foundation has sent a kit to all their member organizations. So um, and, and I'm another I, resource. Thank you. And that and, guide and is also that's a follow-on to it. A suicide toolkit. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that that will make a difference. I'm hopeful that it's um, well taken up by firearm retailers. I personally found that brochure less adequate than I had hoped um, in terms of the specificity of the information that I felt like, anyway, we can talk about that. But, um, but it is a resource and well worth checking out. And you can find these, again, on the AFSP, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention website, and download them. So let's move on to poisonings, since that's the second leading cause. Um, oh, how am I doing on time, my time person? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we have a lot of medications here. We have the childproof cap that most of us over the age of five can't open. Um, I put rat poison up there simply because it is an issue in, in other cultures um, and a lot of different kinds of packaging. Just wanted to mention, since we all hear about it, opioids, you know that there's a huge problem. Uh, Deaths from opioids increased five-fold over 10 years for women and for men three and a half times. More women have died from opioid overdoses than motor vehicle crashes every year. This is a huge, huge problem in this country. These are not all suicides, not by a long shot. Um, many of them though, we don't know. They're undetermined. But there's been some good successes to look at of dealing with toxic substances. I already mentioned about Sri Lanka. Um, so in addition to banning the most toxic forms, Sri Lanka did some other interesting things. They had an education campaign to educate the public about how to use the less harmful pesticides, use this one, not that one, kind of thing. Um, they put resources into healthcare to improve survival after people had ingested. And then they embarked on a, an effort to change the culture overall, a, to create more of a culture that discouraged suicide. So they took this very, very seriously and really were tackling it from a number of different ways. They didn't only have a law that banned the pesticides. I think they recognized that wasn't going to necessarily fix the problem, it was just taking away the means. I already mentioned the United Kingdom and their coal gas. Rural China 
Um, rat poison and pesticides were the leading method that um, women in rural China choose and they embarked on a campaign to keep those items locked and that really reduced suicides among rural women. So some simple examples. I took these photos in my local pharmacy. So here's a bottle of aspirin, 500 tablets. And here's the children's acetaminophen, 24 tablets. Why can't you buy a whole lot of children's acetamin or aspirin? Because we made a law. Because children were getting into the bottles and dying, and 24 will not be a lethal dose. If a child gets a hold of that bottle and eats them all, they still have a chance of survival. If they get a hold of this bottle, that can be deadly. So we recognized years ago that there was an overdose problem among children, and this is one of the ways that we fixed it. So it's not just the cap, but it's, it's like the coal gas, right? Making it less lethal in the formula. You can also change the packaging. So there's those blister packaging, you know, the ones that you break your fingernail on when you try to open them? And they come in a whole different varieties of them, and some of them are really, really pesky to open. Well, in the United Kingdom, they have uh, paracetamol is what we call acetaminophen. And they were having big problems with overdoses. And they changed it to these blister wrapping. It's sometimes called unit dose packaging. And they had almost half as few deaths. Less liver transplants, fewer hospitalizations. Um, it makes it so hard it, gives, it takes a lot of time. You can't just pour the bottle into your hand and swallow. You have to do one by one by one by one. That length of time can be enough for people's ambivalence to kick in, for them to start thinking about, hmm, maybe I don't want to do this. Or maybe they get interrupted. Maybe somebody else comes along. But the fact is, it made a huge difference in the United Kingdom. They also limit how many um, pills the pharmacist can sell at once to one person and they have to have informational brochures. I thought this was interesting because we just passed a new law here in California, just got the bill signed so none of us have really heard about it yet, as one of the attempts to deal with opioids that's going to require pharmacies, not hospital pharmacies, but community pharmacies that sell opioids, they're going to have to also offer to sell um, ways to lock up pills. Locking devices of various kinds and have signage directing the customers, you might want to buy something to lock the pills in. They've done this to prevent what they think, the, the aim was to prevent children having access to the opioids. It wasn't billed as suicide prevention, but I wonder if it might not make a difference if we started locking up first safely disposing of those unwanted medications, maybe not getting them prescribed in the first place, but locking them up when you're not using them, <laughs> especially if there's somebody vulnerable in the household. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with that. Um, I don't think it's enough, but it's a good step in the right direction. Uh, let's see, I did that. Oh yeah, so it's the safe storage products need to be within 50 feet of the counter, which is actually kind of far. It might mean that you know, you're at the pharmacy counter in the back and the thing might be way over here, but that's why they have to have the signs telling you, well, if you go to aisle 14, you can find them there. And here's a few other pharmacy resources. Um, I'm sorry for the yellow. I thought I had changed that. Um, but there's a number of campaigns where pharmacists are also working to prevent suicides. One's a website, pharmacistspreventingsuicides.com. Um, here in California, one of the projects we did with Know the Signs was for some counties we created these pharmacy bags. Um, it's got the pharmacy information on the back and information on the front. And the idea here is you didn't just put, you didn't just hand this out to people if they were getting in a prescription that they might use as a suicide attempt. Whatever you got went in the bag. So it was a broad community education campaign, but it also had this um, it might contain the very pills that you would use. 
San Diego also did, uh, actually Stan Collins was involved with educating pharmacists in San Diego. Washington State has done some distributing naloxone or Narcan. Definitely can help. Doesn't prevent the overdose, but it reduces the effect. Um, and then I just mentioned the bill. We'll quickly go through some um, reducing jumps and then I'm gonna make you all work before you fall asleep. So uh, obviously locked and alarmed doors are one good way of preventing access. I've talked a lot about preventing attempts from these barriers, not just um, bridges, but uh, Toronto, that was another bridge that was the second leading after Golden Gate. That was the second most popular bridge in the world. Thank you. Um, Switzerland put up window guards on the hospitals. Uh, Hong Kong, they put doors on some of the subway stations that led to a 60% decrease of people dying by jumping in front of the subway cars. Um, and uh, most of this is just sort of reinforcing what I've already gone over. So I think we can, I think you get the idea. Two quick stories though. This one just happened last month in St. Paul, Minnesota, where two guys down here, these are the delivery men, but they were delivering beer and they saw this gentleman on the outside of the fence on this highway overpass. And they stopped the truck and they went over and started talking to him. He says, for the next hour, even after police arrived, uh, Mr. Anderson, who's the, the one on the right, kept talking to the man. He asked him his name, where he grew up, whether he had kids. He offered him a 12 pack of Coors Light. He just kept talking to him and telling him how he cared and he wanted him to stay alive. These delivery men had no training in suicide prevention. They just were doing the human thing the man did climb back over the fence and was taken for help. And I just love this story. Offer help. These are finding the hero. We got two of them right here. And then a few months ago here in Detroit, there was a man on, you can't see him, but he was also threatening to jump on a highway overpass. And the state police shut down the highway and got 13 semi-trucks to line up underneath the overpass so that if he jumped, he would land on top of a truck rather than falling all the way to the pavement. And they did their little CB stuff, you know, like truckers do, and they all lined up. The truckers were interviewed afterwards. They felt really good about being able to do this. The man did not jump. And in this newspaper article, they included call, click here for the warning signs of suicide and text or call these numbers so they also included the right kind of information that we like to see. Hanging is much tougher. I will just say that right up front. Um, this slide has got nasty looking data on it, but uh, suffocation is the red line. And this is for all Americans and how it went up um, over 15 years. For white men, it went up much higher. But even for white women, it went up a little bit. And um, this newspaper article did not include any other demographics. It's still way below firearms. This is firearms up here for white men. Hanging is much lower, but it is increasing. And we're very concerned about that in the field. So it's difficult to remove all possible means. I do want to point out that you, it does not have to be head height or higher that people can uh, complete a hanging from doorknobs and lower places as well. So sometimes we think, oh, we just have to do the high stuff. That's not true. Most institutions like hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, jails, prisons, already have guidelines and policies. There's good policies out there. We do have to think about culture. And what I mean by that is um, Kathy Barber, who's with the Harvard School of Public Health and who I respect a lot, really urges us not to focus too much publicly on this. We don't want to accidentally promote the idea that hanging is really available and really lethal. And she says, if even a tiny proportion of the people who currently use pills switch to hanging, we're going to see a huge increase because pills are not very lethal and hanging is, right? 
One thing, she says, that keeps suicide rates relatively moderate in the U.S. is that hanging has relatively low acceptability to people who seriously consider suicide, but in pills have high acceptability. In some cultures, hanging is very acceptable, and happily for a lot of us, it is not. It is not seen as um, painless or kind to the people who find us. So there's reasons why people don't choose certain methods and why they do choose certain methods. Um, there are, unfortunately, some pro-suicide websites that make hanging sound easy and painless. It is not. But we want to be very careful when we publicly talk about this not to say, oh, so many people die by hanging. Hanging is so lethal. So for this group, I'm happy to say that. But um, we need to have some caution when we're talking to the general public so that we don't inadvertently message in the wrong direction and make it sound more available um, than they already think. Right? So I want you all to do a little exercise. And I don't have a lot of time. So we may not get through the exercise today, but you can, this is something you can do at home. Hazard mapping is something, a technique that um, is used in natural disasters and in occupational <coughs> safety. So this is a little fast food restaurant over here. And the hazard maps is they use different color coding to try to identify where's the hot grease? Where do spills happen that you might slip and fall? Where's the electricity? Where's the knives, uh, you know, all those, <laughs> the slicers, all the ways that we, you could harm yourself. And then what do we need to do to make sure that people don't get hurt in those areas? So here's an imaginary apartment based on my father's, who's not imaginary. Um, this is the second floor apartment of an 89-year-old widower. So he's a widower, right? He lives alone. Um, and here's the layout. And where are the hazards? Oh, that didn't work right. OK. Um, so there's windows. There's prescription pills in the bathroom. And there's a firearm in the bedroom. So those are the hazards. But they're not all equally concerned. It's a second floor apartment. We're not worried about the windows. But we are worried about the firearm and the prescriptions. So if we don't like figure out where they are, we can't do anything about them. So once we know this, then we can start to actually try to address where they are. Or a local hospital with a psych unit needs to ask, are the medications locked? Is there access to the roof? What about the parking structure? Do we need to do some kind of um, scan to see about hanging both access to items that someone could use to hang themselves and where they might tie it off. But they also maybe need to think about the community. Those, several of those bridges I mentioned were near psych hospitals. So is there a nearby bridge or a railway? Maybe the hospital needs to look beyond their own property and a little further if they want to make a difference. So the exercise for you that I encourage you to do when you go home or with others is to imagine a home, and again, you're not trying to identify every possible hazard, but which ones are most lethal, most likely to be used. When I had young children, I was encouraged to get down on the floor and crawl around on all fours <laughs> to look from their point of view, and you find all kinds of stuff in the carpet or, you know, that you can hit your head if you stand up on the bottom of the furniture. You see it differently, right? So if we want to do hazard mapping, we need to also think about it from the perspective of someone who might be seeking ways to harm themselves, um, not just from our own point of view. So then you could draw the map or just make a list. And then the next step is then to figure out, well, what strategies can you implement or encourage to reduce access to those items? So quickly here, older adults, so any questions about hazard mapping since we're not actually doing the exercise? Maybe in the afternoon I'll be able to squeeze it in if we're not running behind. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting that older adults, this is California, even though they take a lot of medications and have a lot of pills, still three quarters are firearms. Again, we choose methods based on a lot of different reasons. Older adults tend to have firearms more than youngers. They're more isolated, maybe have less visitors. They're more likely to die from the attempt because they have more health issues. 
So even an attempt that might not be lethal for a 16-year-old could be lethal for the 86-year-old. Um, I'm going to skip the bottom one. The 2016 Suicide Prevention Week Toolkit at the Resource Center I mentioned earlier focused on older adults. So there's a ton of activities in there that you can use with older adults. The Friendship Line out of San Francisco is national and that is designed for older adults. It can be a crisis line and a warm line. Um, it's, so it's a little, it offers suicide prevention. It's an option if you felt like an older client would resonate with that maybe more than calling a suicide prevention crisis line. On SAMHSA's website, there's several toolkits that are available, um, and there's an elder care section on the gun violence restraining order on Speak for Safety. Um, I'm going to skip past rural, unless there's somebody who's got a lot of interest in rural, given that we're in LA. Going once? OK. As you can see, Northern California has much higher rates where it's rural than we do here in the South, which doesn't mean it's not a problem here, but our rates aren't. The numbers are down here, the rates are up there. And I've included some rural resources um, as well. So for youth, we know that youth are often more impulsive in their attempts. Happily, they sometimes don't know what's lethal. So a girl might take a handful of pills thinking she's going to die. She doesn't die because they're not lethal pills. That doesn't mean it wasn't a serious in attempt, that she doesn't have a lot of intent to die. So we don't really want to educate them about what's lethal, but we do want to take that attempt very seriously um, because she may have really wanted to die. She just didn't know enough about the right thing to take, and we don't want her to figure it out for next time. They do often know, though, the key to the safe deposit box, just like they know the password to your computer. <laughs> um, the crisis text line for youth who would much rather text than call. You text to 741-741. Crisis text line does fantastic work, and almost the vast majority of their service is 25 and under. Directing change, there's a whole table out here of directing change, so I hope that you all know about that. Um, and also on the Each Mind Matters Resource Center, this is what I wish my parents knew, step-by-step -step guide to doing. Did I get it? You got it right there. OK. OK. Um, <laughs> what I wish my parents knew. <laughs> OK, so um, this is just rehashing what I've told you. So I'm going to go past that. We saw some of this in Ellie's. Um, talk about these are the other issues that were found among people who died by suicide in addition to mental health problems, that they had relationship problems, physical health problems, problematic substance use. And this makes sense, right? Problems pile up. And then, like Stan said, one of them is the Jenga that you pull out. But they had a lot of other problems. You saw this in Ellie's slides as well. We did not coordinate. So this is just saying like she was, having an overall strategy. You want to address media contagion in your strategy so that the media don't keep reporting the details on these suicide means in ways that can re encourage copycat behavior. We want to encourage help seeking, train people to help, look at the evidence, look at your data, change the culture, Make policy changes as needed. These are all on your handout. I uh, already did that. OK, here's my pie in the sky. Final slide. I heard about this on the radio, and I was really interested. Last year, there were 50,000 cases of cholera in one week in Yemen. And the UN is now using forecasts of rainfall, along with data on the population, about the density, the access to clean water, the seasonal temperature, and they can now predict, putting that data together, the most likely cholera outbreaks that are going to happen up to four weeks in advance, which gives UNICEF time to get in there on the ground with the chlorine tablets, the hygiene kits, environment, and education. 2,500 cases this year. What if we could do this for suicide? So just think about it, because we have a lot of data on our hands. And sometimes we know that something bad is coming down the pike. 
Sometimes we know there's going to be a big layoff from a corporation that might affect a lot of people, or the drought is happening, or the political craziness that we're going through, or the other kind of systemic societal things that are affecting our community, and we can see it coming. So what can we do to get out ahead of it, knowing what we already know, and make a difference? Thank you all for your patience. I know it was a lot at you. I'm sorry it wasn't more interactive. <laughs>